Smith. Brexit Smith. No, oh, that's pretty, yeah. In a James Bond kind of way. Oh, that's quite, quite good, that. <laughs> I've just not been able to pull it off yet. It's the Brexit election. So I'm on my way to Chorley to meet Mr Brexit. No, not Nigel Farage, Mark Brexit Smith. He used to be Mark Smith before changing his name by deed poll to include the word Brexit. The reason I'm going to Chorley, it's the Speaker's seat, Lindsay Hoyle. Now, he used to be in the Labour Party, but obviously becoming the Speaker requires neutrality. And what happens traditionally is most parties don't contest the seat. The Brexit Party stood down their candidate, but he was so enraged, he decided to contest it anyway himself. And so that he could still sport his Brexit credentials, changed his name. Fuck it hell. It is cold up here, mate. <sighs> Excuse me, do you know where the Henry Tate is? Henry Tate? Yeah. yeah mate, um, oh, we're on the wrong side of the station. Yeah, you are. You need to go through here, go down and across, and then the Henry Tate is just on the other side nice of the... Nice one, mate. Uh, Thank you. See that? The place where everyone matters. There it is. Hey Mark, how you doing mate? Good. Good to see you. Cheers. Cheers. I'm a little bit behind you, I left you waiting, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, tell us about Chorley. Tell us about you, tell us about your name change. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I've lived in Chorley since 2004. Chorley's an interesting town. Employment's quite good in Chorley. The main issues we've had in recent years have been with the A&E. The name change, OK. So, I was a Brexit Party candidate. Once Lindsay Hall was elected Speaker, they said, we're standing down. So I spoke to the Electoral Commission to say, if I'm standing on my own, how do I get my message across? Found out that if I change my name, that was OK, that was valid. So that's what I did. Added to that, I'd already started campaigning for the Brexit Party. I had a small team of supporters who put a lot of legwork in, delivering leaflets, we'd done street stalls, and they were all saying to me, why aren't you standing? So in the end, that's what I decided to do, because I think politics needs change. It's, it's very disconnected from people. It is very much a Westminster bubble and very London-centric, and I don't think that's good for the country overall. Parties, every time there's an election, they promise the earth, they get into power and then forget about the manifesto that they've put in, and people are sick of that. So the Brexit party sounded exactly what I wanted. It supported Brexit, it supported changing politics for good, two massive ticks in my opinion. When I was asked to stand down, my message or my sort of reaction was, well, how is this changing politics for good? Is Farage being disingenuous is a bigger question. But you met him, presumably, right? Yeah. What, what was your assessment of him then when you met him as a person? Nigel Farage. Mm. I've met quite a few politicians and most of them are very different on stage, off stage. You know, they've got a, a different persona. Um, I've only met Farage briefly and not, you know, had a long conversation or anything, but I found him to be... He is driven and he's that way on stage and off stage. There's no time off. And perhaps I was one of the few people who thought when he stepped down after the referendum that that wasn't a bad idea. Because I can't imagine the pressure he was living under. I really can't. I mean, he was made a hate figure by most of the press. Um, you know, certainly the left-wing press made him an absolute hate figure. And that must be horrible to live under that level of scrutiny. The biggest result against Berkow, when Farage stood against him as well, was a, a candidate for democracy who got about 10,000 votes in that seat um, against Berkow's 40 of mine, but still. That's so, a significant number. It's a significant number, yeah, I agree. Um, so it will be interesting to see. There is uh, a guy in Chorley who started a petition to try and change the rules to stop the Speaker being uncontested. We'll see. I think, you know, if Lindsay Hall stays as Speaker for the next election, I'm sure we'll have the usual Mr Buckethead and all those sort of characters will no doubt turn up for the election. But for me, this is, it's about democracy, give people a choice. You mentioned Lord Buckethead and things like that. People will see your name on a piece of paper with Brexit in your surname and they'll think, is he serious? There's, I mean, you've got to have fun in these things as well. Yeah. My favourite comment on Facebook so far is somebody described me as their favourite fruit loop in this election. And, yeah, I know politics is deadly serious, but that's quite funny. It is. I mean, Mark Smith is hardly a standout name. <laughs> Don't be so hard on yourself, it's Mark. It's not, though, is it? 
um, it doesn't stand out and it's fairly anonymous. By putting the sort of one of the key causes I stand for in it, I thought it gave people, at least when they go to the ballot box, they would understand what I was about. It doesn't matter what you vote. You know, I've said to people in Jorley, if you voted for Lindsay Hoyle since 2010 when he became Deputy Speaker, what has changed? What has your vote done? What impact has it had on national legislation? And the answer is none. Shall we um, move on? Yeah. Nice one, thank you. We're going right down here now. OK, cool. Oh, what's this? <coughs> This is church. Church, yes, St George's. 80 cigarettes a day. Yeah, yeah. Serious. That's really impressive that you quit that. Yeah. Tell us where we are, Mark. So this is Cosmopolitan, small, local, family-run restaurant in Chorley. Very popular, very good restaurant. Oh, after you, mate. We're going in and get a drink, eh? Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. So this is your mate's place, yeah? Yeah, it is, yeah. How long have you known him for? Oh, yeah. we've been coming here for a long, long time. It's a bit early yet to get going, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no time like the present. Well, no. there, is, there is that, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no time like the present. Tell me then, so... You've changed your name? Yes. Has your wife changed the name? No. And have your kids taken it? No. I'm... I mean, it, I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, denigrating to you, <laughs> but... 5% of the vote... Feel free. Five... <laughs> <laughs> OK, sure, I mean, it sounds like you're used to it. Yeah. Um, 5% of the vote and you lose your deposit, yep. potentially quite costly for you doing this. Even a minimal election campaign, if you just do your deposits, a couple of leaflets, you know, I mean, there's, there's 46,000 addresses in Chorley. You know, with our leafleting crew, we've managed to put about 25,000 leaflets out by hand so far, which is good. I'm pleased with that. Just the cost of those leaflets is three, four hundred pounds. Why do it? Because democracy needs it. it, it demands it for me. It's, it's that important that people get the chance to vote. People fought for the vote, you know, women in particular fought hard for the vote, and it matters. We will get a beer eventually, I hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a... Uh, well, I was going to say I'm sure they're busy, but then... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you saw anyone down there? They're setting up, then. Ah, <laughs> uh, OK, still busy, still busy. You know, political sort of discourse in the UK is combative, and it doesn't need to be, you know. Instead of looking for the areas you disagree with and emphasising them, look for the areas you agree with and emphasise them, I think, is a better way of doing it. The House of Lords, I mean... Don't get me started on that. It's just... It's been turned into just a, a house of patronage. It's got no place in a modern democracy to me. Interesting. It's, you know, you've said you stood for UKIP. You, mm -hmm. you were trying to stand for the Brexit party. Mm -hmm. You've changed your name to Brexit. I ask you, what's your platform? You haven't mentioned the EU once. I'm not just about Brexit, as I say. Um, you know, the reason I'm standing in Shirley is not just Brexit, it's Brexit and democracy. Brexit is important to me. Uh, on any Brexit votes, I would support leaving the EU and its institutions. I'd prefer a free trade agreement, because I think free trade's good. Not just for Britain, it's good for some of the poorer countries in the world who have restrictions on their imports to the UK now. If we could just have a, a common market with the EU, then that'd be a good idea. No problem with that. But the way the EU operates now, with its tariff barriers, it's a protected market, and protectionism is never good. And if we're not fit to battle those in the world of international trade, we won't win. The, the protectionist EU will fail, it'll collapse eventually. So I'd sooner get out now and get moving. So that, that common market then that you support, mm. what sort of things would you like to see included in there? Services, goods, people? I think, I mean, you know, the people thing is obviously a, a big one that, that everyone talks about. I'm actually maybe more pro-migration than most people might suspect. My issue with um, free movement is that it's very, very... It, it's prejudiced against people who don't come from within the EU. You know, I think everyone should be treated the same, just as humans. I don't think you should say, well, these people can all come and go as they please, but, but you, no, you're not good enough. You know, why is that? Because we're Australian? Because we're brown? Why can't we come as well? So I think that's wrong. Real fundamental issue with the EU. It is... I'm not going to use the word racist because it's too widely used. We should take those people equally from wherever they come, you know, based on their merits, not on their ethnic origin. But if as a country we need something, we should encourage people, not punish them for doing it. Can I stop a minute so I can go a beer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be portrayed as an alcoholic on this now, won't I? <laughs> stop. Cut it off. Cut it off. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. Nice one. Beers. A beer. <laughs> Happy days. You were saying. Yeah, OK. So, migration. So. I don't, I'm not open borders, I'm equal borders. So when we need people in the UK, we should bring them in on an equal basis, based on the skills, the merits, not based on the country they come from or the colour of the skin or anything else, that's wrong. If we had an equal approach at our border, 
we wouldn't have people trying to come in in the back of lorries so much because they would know we treat everybody the same and they could apply in a reasonable way. Mm. And that would avoid, perhaps, hopefully, some of these you know, tragedies we've seen in recent years with people trying to get into the UK. It's horrendous, isn't it? It's awful. If, when we leave the EU, we're no longer afforded the protection of the EU and our market is opened up to those cheaper American cars, mm -hmm. what happens to our car industry? It's not, we haven't got a car industry, have we? Well, there's we haven't. Honda in Swindon, Nissan in Sunderland. So where's, where are the profits from Honda go? Japan. Where are the profits from uh, <laughs> Nissan go? But where's our car industry? This car industry you speak of. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, sorry, OK. <laughs> But there are jobs, you know, they employ people, they do contribute to the economy. Just because the, the companies are, you know, foreign owned, it doesn't mean they don't contribute to our economy. It doesn't mean they don't employ people. No, I would agree with that, but why does it cost more to make a car in Britain than in the US? But if American cars are cheaper and we open up our markets to those American cars, people are going to lose their jobs, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing. Is it? You know, we've got a, a focus in the UK and across the Western world, really, on economic growth, GDP growth. We have to have GDP growth. Our productivity is terrible in the UK. If we focused a bit more in improving our productivity and a bit less being obsessed with how many people are employed and how our GDP is growing, we might make a better society. How do you introduce yourself on the doorstep? I say, hi, I'm Mark. Ah. Uh, I'm standing Mark Brexit Smith in the election. <laughs> Am I going to get your vote? That's actually a pretty good sell, to be fair, isn't it? <laughs> If you're a Brexit voter. <laughs> the best way of introducing it I heard was when the first meeting I had with my supporters after I changed my name, one of them said, so are you going to introduce yourself as the name Smith, Brexit Smith? Oh, that's pretty, yeah. In a James Bond kind of way. Oh, that's quite, quite good. <laughs> I've just not been able to pull it off yet. New Bond film coming out yeah. soon, isn't there? Yeah. I wonder if you get into the House of Commons, your first speech, your maiden speech, what are you going to talk about? What is it you'd like to say? What I'd like to talk about, I think, is democracy and how it was almost denied the people of Chorley and how it's been denied people in many constituencies and how it matters and how it's not in the gift of politicians to take that away from people. The thing that tipped me over the edge to stand as an independent was an, a line in the Daily Mail. Here we go. <laughs> that said, Lindsay Hoyle will be re-elected as MP for Chorley. And I thought, well, do the people of Chorley not have any say in that? And that is wrong. It's, it's really quite a, a massively important part of our society and our democracy. That is just wrong. That's an arrogant, you know, should we all lie in the streets and doff our caps kind of approach. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. So that will be, I guess, the basis of it. Mark Brexit-Smith, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you.